Oh, Infamous. Hey, that's a good game. What is this random phone doing on my desk? And who's been calling me all this time? It's time to find out. Hello? May I speak to the Pyro Gunner? I'm sorry. The Pyro Gunner can't come to the phone right now. Why not? Why? Oh, because he's dead! Oh, that didn't hang up right now. Oh, he died. Shit, this is embarrassing. Oh. <sighs> what was the most defining game of the last generation? Of course, there's many different answers because there are many great games to choose from. The Last of Us, Bioshock, Portal, Skyrim, Mass Effect, Uncharted 2, Call of Duty 4, Batman Arkham City, Dark Souls, Fallout 3, Grand Theft Auto 5, Minecraft, etc. But mine is Infamous, a game not usually brought up in that discussion. It's an open-world superhero game made by Sucker Punch Productions and released in 2009, almost 10 years ago. I think it's one of the greatest and my personal favorite game of the last generation. It's not perfect in every way, but no game is. It stands out as being an exceptional open-world action platforming story game. It's both extremely fun and deeply meaningful. I think it's a masterpiece, but I wouldn't really say it's famous or infamous for being such. At Sucker Punch, uh, we, get, we get some fan letters, um, and sometimes they give us really helpful tips. Like uh, this kid right here, he says that if, if we stop making Sly Cooper games, we might lose business. He's not uh, threatening us, but he is warning us, so I appreciate that. When I mention this game to casual gamers, most of the time they've never heard of it, while they have heard of titles such as the ones I mentioned earlier. Whenever you look at the best of the generation lists, Infamous hardly ever pops up. Many of the best games of the last generation have also been remastered for the current generation. But has Infamous been remastered? Nope! And at this point, it seems really unlikely. Infamous is not necessarily underrated because it got very good reviews, but I think it is criminally overlooked. And that's a real shame because it's so damn good. I think it's gonna be a game people are really gonna enjoy, so I'm, I'm glad it's gonna get the support it deserves. You know? So, let's get started with my way too long and in-depth analysis and review of Infamous. I'll go mostly spoiler-free to start off with, but for a majority of the review, I will have to talk about spoilers. And don't worry, I'll warn you before I say any big ones, if you haven't played the game. This is why Infamous is an overlooked masterpiece. <laughs> The game begins with a shot of a peaceful city and tells you to press the start button. There is the expectation that this is a main menu, but it's not. The game just starts. Maybe this is just what Sucker Punch likes to do to create a seamless experience. They do this in Sly as well, but this time the game uses this to involve player action with the story. Pressing start causes the blast, a giant explosion that gives the protagonist Cole electric superpowers. So by pressing start, you caused it on accident, just like Cole did. A massive explosion is a way to start the game that immediately grabs your attention and has no exposition. It gives you a lot of questions and no answers, which creates a very interesting mystery. It really gets your brain going on trying to guess what's happening. This is the only time you ever see Empire City before the blast. It's peaceful and you can hear children playing in the background, which contrasts with everything else in the game. The world is saved here, or doesn't need to be, yet. What is so fantastic about the prologue is how it attaches the player to Cole and makes you feel like you are him. You are put right into his shoes and made to feel the same as your playable character immediately. You're disoriented by learning the controls of a new game, but so is Cole because of what just happened. Neither of you have any idea what happened or how you got here. The game eases you into the controls without holding your hand or spending too much time on it. Just getting down the most simple of actions, walking, looking around, and jumping. This is a far more effective way to learn about a character and become attached to them than hearing a backstory, especially in a video game. Cole's backstory is unimportant. He's just a normal, boring, everyday guy who had something extraordinary happen to him. 
The prologue just sets up the basics. The next mission sets up many of the main elements of the game. The characters, setting, and gameplay systems. And the two main aspects of gameplay are climbing and combat. You can climb just about anything in the city. You can go anywhere. It's like a power in and of itself. Empire City is a vertical, interesting play space, like a jungle gym. It's like playing as a kid, you know? It's just purely fun to climb on the jungle gym. So, why not make more jungle gyms for adults, you know? It's fun to be able to go anywhere, and it's great that there is no fall damage because it makes the game more fun and less stressful while climbing. Coal is magnetized towards any surface you can grab, which helps a lot. You won't find yourself missing a ledge. Sometimes the magneting is annoying when you aren't trying to grab anything, although it's usually pretty accurate. We had to work really, really hard on figuring out what the player really intended uh, when they're jumping through the air. Are they actually trying to grab that ledge, or are they trying to grab the ledge next to that? We call it reading the player's mind through his thumbs. We've been pretty successful with it, and it makes the game really fun to play because it, it doesn't feel like you're using the controller. If we do our, our job right, then the controller disappears. You don't think about it at all. You just do what you want to do, and it happens. Climbing is kind of repetitive, but it's always fun to get on top of buildings and jump from one to the other. It's great that not every surface of every object is grabbable. You still have to think about how to climb things. It's not mindless button mashing. You can also knock down certain objects to help you reach over a wide gap or up to a rooftop. Later in the game, once you have more powers, you move faster on rooftops than you do on the ground. So thank you, Russian kids. Infamous is in many ways a third-person shooter with superpowers. And that's not a bad thing because the combat works and is fun. There are more conventional things like grenades and rockets, but we've framed them in a way that it's, it's, it is Cole using and extending his powers. You start with the basics and build up more and more moves throughout the game. This gives the player time to get good at using each move, and it also makes you feel like you're becoming more and more powerful as the game progresses. Let's go through the moves you have to start out with. The first is movement walking, jumping, dodging, and taking cover. These aren't necessarily what you would think of as combat moves, but they do play a significant role in it. In combat, it's used to position yourself for either attacking an enemy, escaping an enemy attack, or moving to a drainable object. I love that climbing and combat can happen simultaneously because it makes you feel free to fight while climbing and makes battles more intense. We knew we really wanted him to be able to do these when hanging off the side of a pole, when standing on a bar, balancing on a bar, even when hanging from the edge of a ledge. And uh, so we really put a premium on making sure that he could do all those things and he could fluidly move from jumping and landing to immediately shooting. Cole can do a simple dodge roll to avoid enemy attacks. It's quick and responsive. He can also get into cover, although don't let that fool you. This isn't a cover shooter. It's more of an option than something that you have to do. Your health will regenerate over time if you don't get hit. In many games, this slows down the action while you heal and can make games less fun. Thankfully, in Infamous, the automatically regenerating health is more of a last resort. Having power over electricity, Cole can drain it from the environment to heal himself. My broken bones are mending. This makes it very important that you can find a place to drain. The good thing is, you're in an urban environment where electricity is all around you, and if you are panicking and need health fast, pressing L3 will highlight the things you can drain from. Being able to drain to get health back ensures that combat never slows down when you are damaged. It's even a viable option to play risky and take damage as long as you can drain right after. Cole can punch people with lightning. There's not much of a melee combat system in this game, but it is useful when you're right next to an enemy. But that kick is really satisfying. You can also press square while in the air to do a powerful slam move called the Thunder Drop. The higher you are... Enchanted. Oh shit! I, I mean, the higher up you are, the more damage it does to more enemies. This gives an advantage to climbing and being on a rooftop. It's also just a lot of fun. Shoot somebody in the face with a lightning bolt which is, I know, for me, kind of a core fantasy. The bolt is your basic ranged attack. It has a fast fire rate, low damage, and using it poses little risk because it doesn't use up any of Cole's energy. The remaining attack powers do use up this bar, balancing how often they can be used so you aren't too powerful. The only one of these powers that is available at the start of the game is the blast, 
also known as the Shockwave. This move does very low damage, but it can hit multiple enemies to knock them down, hurl objects towards them, or throw them off rooftops. <laughs> By the end of the game, you have a large set of moves that can be combined however you want and see fit. Each new move adds more options and giddy superpowered fun. Anyways, that's what you do, but what are you fighting? Ooh, I got some big most of the enemies in this game are humanoids with guns. The first group of enemies is the Reapers, former criminals who have banded together to obtain power in a lawless city. Or so it seems. First, here's the basic gunmen. These guys have semi-automatic rifles and are all over the rooftops in the Neon District. Their rifles do low damage, but they can be dangerous in numbers. They can also throw grenades to ensure that you don't stand in one place for the whole fight, but to counter this, you can use the blast to push their grenades back at them. The shield reaper is the same, except he has a shield. Killing him with melee will take more hits, and it's best to blast his shield away, get in close and maneuver around him, or just be a good shot. The next one has a shotgun. The shotgun does a lot of damage and will stun you. They tend to run towards you quickly and are very dangerous up close. Dispatching them with speed is the best option. The rocket guy fires an RPG at you. A direct hit will kill you instantly, but there is an audio cue to warn you he's about to fire. If not directly hit, you'll take a lot of damage and be knocked back. These enemies are slow, but you always have to watch out for them. Just like with the grenades, you can use the blast on rockets to deflect them, and if you're lucky, hit enemies with them. Well, he was running after us, I was screaming, go, go, go! The suicide bomber will run at you and explode. They are always the most immediate danger unless you are above them, because none of the enemies in this game can climb. Wait, none of the enemies in this game can climb? So to get on rooftops, they have to, like, walk up the stairs or take an elevator? That must be annoying because they're always on the damn rooftops. Why? What's so interesting up there? Do they seriously just wait up there all day for Cole to go by so they can shoot at him? <sighs> I've found a major plot hole in this game's story. I no longer think it's a masterpiece and will now end the video in shame. Machine gun enemies fire machine guns that shoot you real fast and make you die. It's best to take cover from them because of their quick damage output. Most of them are turrets, sometimes on trucks, but sometimes they are carried by hand. Some members of the Reapers, called Conduits, got powers in the blast. Their powers are just weaker than Cole's because they weren't as close to the Ray Sphere. I think. Reaper Conduits can teleport and do this thing that's like a weaker version of Cole's Lightning Storm move that he gets later in the game. The combat has a lot of depth with how and which enemies are placed in fights, and your options to survive and take them out. You have a lot to manage, what order to kill enemies in, how often you'll drain, which moves to use, which enemies to use them on, etc. I'm gonna use this fight as an example. I recorded myself playing through the game multiple times, so I have multiple separate times that I fought the same enemies, but I played the fight differently each time. We are going to look at three of those times that I fought these same enemies. The first time, I shoot bolts at the first enemy, then kick him when he falls down. Then I used the storm on the next two enemies, but it only hits and kills one of them. I took damage and lost energy, so I go back to drain. Then I go back and shoot bolts at the survivor, lob a grenade at two enemies in the distance, and try to shoot the turret guy with bolts, but miss and take some damage. So I use the shield, get in front of them all, and use the storm to kill the turret guy, as well as the two guys in the distance. I shoot and kill the survivor of my first storm with bolts, and then an invisible conduit enemy I hadn't seen before jumps on the turret and starts shooting me, so I kill him with another shield and storm combo. The second time, I hit the first guy with arc lightning, a blast, and bolts. I get shot while doing this, so I drain from a nearby source. I use the shield to get closer to the next two guys, and then blast them and hit them in the air with arc lightning, but get no kills. I also lob some grenades, but I'm being shot by the turret, so I go behind cover and blindly use the storm and kill the conduit. I drain to get health and energy, then turn around and shoot the two guys I blasted earlier. I miss, so I throw some grenades at them and one is killed. 
The other is knocked down, so I use precision to quickly kill him. I also use precision to kill the guy at the turret while he shoots me. I quickly run behind the turret to prevent the remaining enemies from using it. I have no energy left, so I have to rely on bolts and a kick to kill one of them while being shot, which puts me back in front of the turret and with low health, so I have to run back again and kill the final enemy with melee before he can kill me with the turret. Then I bioleach him to fill my depleted health and energy. Okay, let's go through this fight one last time. I kill the first guy with bolts and a kick. I blast the next one while shooting at another with bolts. I get shot by the turret being manned by the conduit, so I put my shield up and run right in front of him and kill him as well as the other enemy with a lightning storm. I try to destroy the turret, but the game doesn't let me because of a stupid glitch! More on that later. So I shoot and miss the guy with bolts, drain, blast him, kick and kill him, turn around to beat the shit out of his friend, get shot by another guy on that turret that I couldn't destroy, put the shield up and go towards him, realize I didn't finish beating the shit out of his friend, kill his friend, then run back and shoot the turret guy with bolts. As you see, one fight can play out in many different ways depending on how you choose to play the game. Sucker Punch are the masters of good controls. What buttons you press just feel right, and executing moves and combos while also climbing feels extremely exciting and satisfying. L3 is also used very well to combine many functions into one button. It scans for drainable objects, highlights enemies, finds ghosts in some missions, and helps you look for collectibles. The menus are minimalistic, pleasing to look at, and easy to navigate while taking you out of the experience as little as possible. It's kind of disappointing that you can't change the controls because I feel like you should be able to do that in every game, but I don't think I would if I could in this one. When it comes to level design, there are two main types of missions, and some that are somewhere in between the two. Linear levels, where you have to complete objectives in a specific order, and more open levels, where you have to complete a few of the same objective in any order you want, usually three or four times. Linear missions allow for Sucker Punch to have more control over exactly what you experience, and open levels give you the freedom to play in a sandbox. Many of the open levels also take place on more than one island, which is great to make use of the play space available for an even bigger sandbox. Each type is used appropriately in the story, and the open levels are mixed up a lot to keep them interesting. Many story missions are given to you at the same time as other ones, so you can choose what order to do them in. It's nice to have that freedom when possible. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Woo! Zeke ran down all those stairs in the time it took Colt to jump? What? Up on the roof with a schoolgirl crash. Zeke is Cole's best friend, and he lives on a roof. So did he live here before the blast too? Because if he had shelter before, why would he not want it now? So he probably did live here before the blast, but what about rain or lightning? It also would be pretty easy to get robbed when it's all- It's because Sucker Punch didn't want to make indoor environments for the game. Oh, yeah. I guess that does make sense. Hey, who was that? I thought I hung up the phone. So, since Zeke lives on a roof, we know he's pretty poor and almost homeless. He's immature and often acts like he's still a child. He leaves old beer cans and pizza boxes out all over the place, reads comic books, watches cartoons, uses words like donkey balls and cashola, and doesn't take serious situations seriously at all. <laughs> awesome! Yeah, awesome. Until we run into a wall of cops. Cole seems to not find much humor in Zeke's retelling of their prior mischievous adventures, but Zeke thinks they're hilarious and like I said, awesome! <laughs> Zeke makes batteries to power the stuff on his roof. He's handy and knows about electrical engineering. How fucking convenient. He always wears sunglasses and has a cool hairstyle. He believes conspiracy theories just to make his life more interesting, and even has his own fraudulent business where he sells phony batteries to con people. The ones that explode when you use them? Hell, he doesn't know that. He's quite the selfish asshole, which foreshadows the direction his character takes in the story. Cole sees his powers as a burden because of the responsibility they come with, but Zeke adores and envies them. This superhero racket is great, man. Solving crimes, getting some loving from the ladies, 
I'd get used to living like this. You're not actually a superhero, Zeke. I get the impression that before the blast, Zeke got more attention than Cole and enjoyed being in the spotlight. But now he's less important and becomes jealous of Cole. You're so cool, it makes me hate you so much. We're getting out of here, one way or another. Follow my lead. I really like this small detail and how much it reveals about Zeke's character. It shows that he has a desire to be in control. It's like he just wants to turn his childhood fantasies of being the coolest, most popular guy around into a reality even though that's not helpful to anyone at all. Zeke may not be the best person to have as a friend, but no one is a perfect friend. What matters is that deep down, Zeke genuinely cares about Cole. He stays with him while he heals from the blast, and he's the only one who trusts Cole after he's falsely accused. Even in my worst times, you can see the best of me. As you are introduced to Zeke, you are also introduced to Empire City, as he leads you through its trashed streets, violent crime, and broken people. You are given simple and to-the-point tutorials for climbing and combat that fit within the story because Cole is learning how to use his powers at the same time you are. The world moves on another day, another drama, but not for me, not for me, all I think about is karma. Now, there is actually a third major part of the gameplay, which is karma, though I wouldn't consider it to be as important as climbing and combat because it's used far less often. Karma is a morality system that presents Cole with choices throughout the game to be good or evil. Cole's overall moral standing is tracked on a meter with six sections, indicating how good or evil he is. Your moral standing affects parts of the story as well as how the people of Empire City view you, thus why it's called karma. This is where the medium of video games becomes very interesting when telling a superhero story. The interactivity allows for choices on how to use your powers, for the benefit of yourself or other people. The game's title embraces that this is what the game is about, being stylized with the N in Infamous being lowercase to show two words in one. There's so many options for using choices in interactive storytelling, and while the karma system does benefit the game, it's also very flawed. It ironically has both good and bad aspects to it. So let's talk about them. First, the pros. The more you use your powers for good things, you'll find that your powers start offering you opportunities to maybe be more precise with your attacks. On the flip side, the more evil you are, the more grand and destructive your powers will become kind of on a course way. And that's kind of our, our desire to really give the player this experience of, hey, it's, it's the path I'm choosing that matters. The two moral paths each have their own upgrades. Evil makes your powers more destructive, and good makes them more precise. This adds even more depth to combat. Certain choices do affect the story, and you get morally and emotionally different versions of the same scenes. The city will have a different attitude towards you, and after the game's ending, both versions of the city will look very different. We wanted to make the thing have a character and sort of look back at you for what you did, you know, to respond, and not just be this inert mass. These differences in gameplay and story give you a reason to replay the game. Another pro is the dialogue that is the same whether you're good or evil. It's written to fit for either version of Cole. Most lines fit both sides of the story because Cole is facing the same struggles either way, and some lines of dialogue can even be interpreted differently based on your moral standing. For example, this line Cole says in Reply to Trish. We'll see. Got a lot of sick people that need help. They come first, Cole. Of course they do. That can be taken as a genuine statement on good, or a sarcastic comment of annoyance on evil. They come first, Cole. Of course they do. The tone of the voice acting sounds sarcastic, but not fully sarcastic, allowing it to be interpreted either way. And the best aspect of karma is that being a hero isn't forced upon you. It's a choice. For you to make a choice that feels heroic, you need to be given the option to be a total jerk, to be selfish. Otherwise, there is no choice. The game's hero story would be far less effective if you weren't actively choosing it, knowing there is another path that you could follow that is more beneficial to you as a player. That's not to say that the evil version of the game isn't worth playing at all. It's morbidly fun to play as a bad guy, and the story will reflect how being selfish is wrong. Alright, now the cons. The story barely changes at all based on your choices. This can make it seem like what you choose has very little impact and importance. 
That being said, I understand that having each choice dramatically change the story and create branching paths would be a lot of content to develop, especially for how small Sucker Punch was when they made this game. They're also not a huge team by today's standards, you know, they're less than 50 people at this point. And for a team that size to build something this good and this well crafted is pretty amazing. Still, no matter the excuse, the choices feel kinda weightless because they have minimal consequences. The choices are also pretty unrealistic. Every choice has a clear good and evil option with no middle ground. There could have been much more interesting choices in the game if they weren't confined to a black and white sense of morality. Many upgrades are tied to your karmic ranking, so if you don't want to make all good or all evil choices, you'll risk losing upgrades and the XP that you spent on them. So the game forces you to stick to one side. It makes sense that a person would likely choose mostly good or mostly evil anyways, but because the game is designed this way, there is only one real choice. You either choose to be good or evil, and each choice in the game after that just reaffirms your standing instead of giving you an actual moral challenge. It gets repetitive and loses the point of having a choice in the first place. Alright everybody, official spoiler warning beyond this point. If you haven't played the game and don't want to know what happens in it, then don't watch the rest of this video. I think most people watching this video are fans of the series and have played this game, but just warning the few of you who haven't. Alright, let's continue. Also, all of the comic cutscenes that don't have a specifically different evil version still have blue lightning when you're evil. This is minor, but just lazy because it's so easy to fix. Here, I can even do it. Is this what my powers are gonna do to me? This is what my powers are gonna do to me. Speaking of different colors for Cole's lightning, it doesn't make sense that Cole's lightning would turn red or black when he's evil, but I do like the visual difference and symbolism. Kessler even has white lightning, which symbolizes his middle ground morality. Cole's appearance also changes, which I'm not as much of a fan of, but it doesn't bother me too much. It just doesn't make sense that Cole would stop bathing when he's evil. Choices could have been so much more in this game. There are many interesting moral dilemmas in the story, but the karma choices are not any of them. Kessler kills innocent people to ultimately save the world. The government's response to the blast protects the many but lacks care for the people in Empire City. What should be done with the race sphere, and how will the world respond to conduits? There is so much morally questionable material in this game, but instead of having the choices revolve around it, the choices are strictly about selfishness versus selflessness, boiling down to them all being the same choice. Each choice could have had its own separate consequences on what happens in the story and gameplay, but instead they just add or subtract points from your karma meter and sometimes have a different cutscene. Karma is used more like two viewpoints on the same story to add depth to its themes of selfishness versus selflessness, rather than unique choices with more meaningful consequences. Infamous is a game about uh, Cole, who's kind of a normal guy. Um, what happens when he gets superpowers? How does he deal with it? Uh, what choices does he make? Um, and it's in the setting of a city that where a big disaster has taken place. Uh, so. Yes. Why Karma works so well, although being flawed, is because Infamous has the perfect protagonist, Cole McGrath. He's a bike messenger. Nobody special. Someone unimportant in society having no power at all. I remember trying to find the character of Cole McGrath, and I remember a distinct design meeting where one of the artists, Bart, came into the meeting that day with this idea that what if we made him a bike messenger? That was a really, I thought, great idea. It was somebody who really belonged in an urban landscape and who most people avoid eye contact with. He's extremely relatable. I know I've woken up in a fiery crater before. How about you? Cole is an average guy who's down on his luck. One day he's living his boring, unimportant, normal life, and the next, the world is falling apart, the odds are stacked against him, and his actions will determine everything. Cole doesn't want this tremendous weight on his shoulders, he just wants everything to be okay. It's easy to project yourself onto Cole because he's a blank slate of a character. He has very little backstory and personality. The only backstory we know is that he was a bike messenger, his best friend is Zeke, and his girlfriend is Trish. And that's all we need to get the story going, nothing more. There is actually one other thing we know about Cole before the blast, which is that he's an urban explorer and parkourist. Uh, are you having any problems finding your way around down there? Nah, I got into urban exploration about four years ago. Crawled all over this city, so I know these sewers like the back of my hand. 
This is in the game because Sucker Punch likes to explain the unrealistic parts of the story to make it more believable. Most of these explanations are nice, but I think this one goes too far. I think it's perfectly reasonable to assume that Cole can climb well because of the strength and stamina his powers give him, and no fear of injury because he doesn't take fall damage. The fact that he was an urban explorer before is an unnecessary piece of backstory that adds nothing to his character. Usually, it's a really bad thing when any character, especially a protagonist, has no personality. In a movie, your story would fail to connect to the audience and make them care, but in a video game, you control the protagonist, and in Infamous, Cole's lack of personality is actually a good thing. Sometimes he's grumpy and sometimes he's a little sarcastic, but the guy is seriously lacking in charisma. You have to kill them. All of them. Promise me, I'll do what I can. Because Cole lacks personality, he's sort of like a blank avatar that you can project yourself onto. You will create the person Cole becomes through the choices you make. He'll either be a power-consumed monster or a determined hero. Some games go all the way with this idea and give you a completely silent protagonist, being nothing more than a body you control. I'm glad Cole isn't taken this far though because his relationships, motivations, opinions, and emotions are necessary to tell this story. The player and Cole easily become one and the same, focusing Cole's experience onto you, drawing you more into the story and making it more personal. The character of Cole McGrath also helps karma work by taking an ordinary, average, unimportant person, probably like yourself, and making him extraordinary, special, and influential, and forcing him to make choices that affect everyone. The phrase that we always talked about was zero to hero. You want to be this guy who's incredibly low status at the beginning of the game, and you want to be either famous or infamous at the end. So, the first choice in the game is to let civilians eat food or take it all for you and your friends. This is a good first test of selfishness from a story perspective, but in terms of gameplay, this choice is meaningless because food is not something the player uses in the game. It works as a tutorial for karma, but has no depth. This choice also has very little effect on the story. Oh, I'm so glad you got the food down. These poor people are starving. What's wrong with you? People are starving, and you're stealing the only food they've seen in days? I guess Trish is a little more mad at you, but either way, Trish gets mad at you because of the TV jacker falsely accusing Cole. Boy, you and me, we got big reputations, ah. Trish's sister Amy died in the blast, and seeing footage of Cole opening the package that caused it leads Trish to believe that Cole is responsible for her death. Trish is a doctor and is put under a lot of stress right now because there are so many people who require medical attention. She really cares about people and their well-being, which is why she gets so pissed at Cole and ultimately doesn't get back together with him if he takes evil actions. Trish is understandably very stressed out, and with everyone else blaming Cole, she joins in and makes him a scapegoat for her problems. This is the first of many betrayals Cole will face. Although Trish is angry at Cole for a majority of the game, What the hell is going on up there? There are more sick people than ever. You're making things worse. This loss is still felt by the player because she is set up as being in a happy relationship with him when the game starts. How are you feeling? Alright, I guess. See you guys at Archer Square. I love you. You too. Cole being blamed for something he didn't do and having his girlfriend turn her back on him puts him in a tough situation. Doing the right thing would be more difficult because everyone hates him and doesn't believe in him. It would be easier to get angry at the people and return their hatred rather than be their hero. I think the food choice would have been a little more effective if it took place after he's blamed for the blast instead of before. Then Cole would have a tougher decision and more reason to be selfish. Zeke is the only person who decides to stand with Cole. They decide to escape the city and run away from their problems. Would you run away with me? Already we have another karma choice, and this choice actually uses gameplay incentives. You choose to fight the cops alone or cause a riot to make the fight easier. Are you willing to have a greater challenge to save fictitious video game people? This is a good choice. Anytime that there's an interesting resource that the character wants that inherently hurts someone else, you're faced with this choice of, I want this thing, am I willing to hurt this person to get it? Cole and Zeke try to escape, but the government guns down all of the innocent people with them and they barely survive. Cole meets Moya, an FBI agent who wants to work with him. I don't trust nobody and nobody trusts me. I'll be the actress starring in your bad dreams. She says she can let him out of the city if he finds her husband John and brings her the Ray Sphere, the device that caused the blast and gave Cole his powers. 
John is also an FBI agent who was assigned with infiltrating the First Sons, a secret organization that created the Sphere. These are used well as objectives to move the plot forward. Cole agrees to help Moya despite not trusting her because he has no other choice. Maybe her husband really is in danger. You feel kinda bad for her, although her people did just kinda murder everyone a few seconds ago. Anyways, I love the relationship between them. Moya's highly suspicious, but the only hope Cole has right now. And she knows that all he wants is to be free, so she has to maintain power over him. Neither one trusts the other, but they're forced to work together to get what they want. This shaky alliance is reflected in the gameplay with Cole having to go back to the city by climbing the bottom of the bridge. The pipes are not sturdy and you're not sure which will give way and lead to a fall to your death. It feels like progress is being lost, you were trying to get out of the city and now have to go back in. Cole is forced to take on the responsibility that he doesn't want. Hey guys, how's it going? This is the Power Gunner, and welcome to episode 527 of Infamous Second Age Power Ideas. In this episode, we have some more power ideas that I will go through that are inspired by your comments. That's right, I love you people. Justin Capra says, I wonder what would happen if a steam power was added. Well, don't you worry, Justin. You're about to see what happens when a steam power is added. So here is the look for steam on good and evil. It's lighter on good, darker on evil. You know, sort of like a lot of these powers I've done. Here is how you drain steam. You drain it from any source of water. You know, it can be steam, it can be ice, it can be normal water. All right, here is the steam dash. This is the circle move that you use to move faster. Um, here it shows Delson first just, you know, using it on the ground, but then he can also use it to go into vents and get sucked up by them and then blown out by them so that he can, like, gain elevation. It's, it's really cool. Anyways, here is the steam shot. He just sort of shoots some steam at people and hurts them with the power of steam. Here is the melee for steam. We see Delson using his chain here and steam is like on his chain. I, I guess it, it hurts people because it's like really hot or something. Here is my idea for the steam grenade. Delson throws it and this cloud of steam shows up and it makes all of the enemies in it like cough so that you can like subdue them or you can just brutally execute them. It's great. All right, everybody, here is the steam rocket. It's a rocket that you shoot at people and it's made of steam. And finally, for our karma bomb for steam, we have the steam drop. Delson will shoot up into the air, do a backflip, and then go back down and make a huge steam explosion with a lot of steam, and it kills many enemies. Now, I know what you're thinking. This moveset is just like Neon, and you're wrong. <laughs> 